clothes are often something we don't think about in the modern day world. We toss on a t-shirt, put on a pair of jeans and we're out the door. But it didn't used to be that way. Clothing used to be a very expensive thing. The Aztec women would pay taxes in thread delivered to the emperor. And that's because spinning used to be an incredibly labor-intensive task that really limited how much cloth you could produce. But what does that mean for you as a fantasy world creator? How can spinning fundamentally alter your world? How can it be a thing that draws your readers in and tells them a story of what your world is like? That's what I'd like to talk about today. Welcome to another episode of Just In Time Worlds with your host, Marie Mullaney. If you like topics like this, do hit the subscribe button down below. And if you're interested in discussing topics like this, there is a link to my Discord server down below as well. Okay, let's get cracking. We have found spindle worlds going back as far as 2900 BCE in the Minoan civilization. We have been spinning various materials into thread and yarn for as long as agriculture has been a thing, and perhaps even before that. The spindle wheel was likely the first wheel we created, well before we created the load-bearing wheels that formed our method of transportation. The very first spindle that we used was called a drop spindle, and it's basically just a stick with a circle at the end and a hook at the top. You hook the whatever, the fleece or the flax threads or the cotton into the hook at the top and then you let it dangle and you spin with your hand like this. And as you're spinning, the thread is pulled out and made into a long threaded piece which can then be woven into cloth. Now here's the thing, if there, are, if there are no threads, there's no weaving. If there's no weaving, there's no cloth. And all of your clothing is then made of animal skins, I guess. So spinning needs to happen. But spinning requires an enormous amount of labor. And I really do mean enormous. Let's take denim as an example. In a normal pair of jeans, a bog standard average pair of jeans requires 10 kilometers of thread. Okay, sure. But what does it take to make 10 kilometers? Spinning doesn't look that hard, right? It would take a master spinner about 13 days to produce that amount of thread. Just the thread, mind you. We're not talking about combing. We're not talking about weaving. We're not talking about pre prepping the cotton or picking it. Just producing the thread from the already combed cotton would require 13 days of eight hours a day spinning. Can you imagine what a pair of jeans would cost if spinning wasn't automated? So how did people deal with it before spinning became automated? Well, honestly, women spun. They spun everywhere all the time. Using the drop spindle, they could spin while they were out in the fields watching the flocks. They could spin while they were minding children. In fact, spinning was such a common activity that the Renaissance city of Florence banned spinners from gathering on the public benches to spin together. Why? because there were so many of them and they would sit there and spin. Everybody spun. And you can see that in our language. We talk about a spinster being somebody who hasn't gotten married. We talk about being on tenterhooks. We talk about somebody being of high moral fiber. We talk about taking an airline shuttle. We talk about weaving through traffic. This activity was so pervasive in our culture, in all our cultures, that it has become invisible to us to a large extent. 
And when I say all our cultures, I do mean all our cultures. The Aztec women paid their taxes to the emperor in thread spun because it was a valuable commodity. So if you don't have an industrialized society, if you have not yet automated the process of spinning, then you probably have women or somebody sitting constantly spinning all the time. Now, in our world, it was women probably as a holdover from agriculture, where the men would go out into the field and using their muscular strength would be plowing the fields and so on. And the women would be doing the more dexterous tasks at home that didn't require main strength like spinning. So you could go with that and make it a gender derivative task where women are spinning and men are doing the things that bring in the spinning like farming cotton. But you could also, since this is fantasy, go with a different setup. So you could have a race that is specifically adapted to spinning. You could have a creature that is specifically adapted to spinning. You could, you could create some sort of domesticated creature that can sit with a drop spindle and spin and spin and spin and thus replace human labor with animal labor, which I think would also create a very interesting dynamic because those creatures would then become one of the most valuable domesticated creatures in your world. And I think that they would be even more valuable than, say, dogs or horses because of the pervasive need for clothing. Everybody needs something to wear. So if you had creatures that could handle your spinning for you, which is the most fundamental step in creating the cloth that we need for weaving of clothes, I think that would make quite a difference to how your society interacts. But let's say that you do go with it being a human activity and you now want to automate it. Well, how was that done in our history? You know that I do like a good story of espionage. And this is another one of those tales. So first we have to talk about the invention of the spinning wheel with the, with the belt and wheel. This was invented in China in around the 400s or so. It spread from China to India and from India eventually to Europe. And, the, and spinning wheels took over from the drop spindle. Now, a spinning wheel did make it faster to produce thread, but it didn't make it that much faster. The Italians, however, came up with a means to make it a lot faster, but only with silk. So they invented what they called silk throwing machines that were water driven. Now, these machines were housed in massive buildings and they were these huge like constructions of um, belts and, and wheels and they required a couple of people to oversee them and to make sure that the, you know, the silk didn't get jammed up in anything. And they would throw the silk forward and backward. And this would create a thousand spindles of silk thread in a day, whereas a human spinner could only produce one spindle of silk thread. But silk is a luxury item, right? Even if the production of it is very simple, you're still not going to weave sailcloth out of silk. Sail, let me tell you, was a massive consumer of thread. King Canute's fleet, of the, the northern fleet of King Canute, consumed millions of meters in woven cloth for the sails of the ship. And that all had to be spun thread. You're not going to use silk for that stuff. Okay, so how did the throwing machines become cotton machines and where does this heist come in? So there was a dude called Thomas Lombi who sent his brother John to it Italy to go and appropriate <laughs> their technology of silk throwing. So John toddled along to Italy. He bribed a priest because somehow a priest is always involved in these early espionage stories. I don't know why. The same happened with the Byzantium story. Remember when the priests went and stole the silkworm eggs from China? 
always a priest. Watch out for them priests. Anyway, so John got himself a job in a Itali Italian silk throwing manufacturing machine. And while he was working during the day, he, you know, let his eyes do the stealing. As one does if you know, you're Apple ripping off Xerox's interfaces or Windows ripping off Apple's interfaces or John ripping off the Italian silk throwing machines. And so he went back to England with this knowledge and he and his brother built the first English silk throwing machine. But it's still a silk throwing machine, right? Then there was a dude called Lewis Paul who eventually figured out how to take that silk throwing technology and make out of it a cotton manufacturing machine. And this machine could produce cotton thread in vast quantities. And that could feed the English weaving industry, which was currently starved of thread. It is interesting that when these machines were first introduced, there was a lot of concern around them. People thought that this would put the spinners out of business and that, you know, women would no longer be able to earn any kind of a living and it would be, you know, the death of English industry and all those kinds of things that normally come with that kind of techno technological change. But the actual impact of these machines were that they freed women. They freed women from the eternal need to be spinning and to hence be able to explore other career opportunities, other things to do. It allowed women to become weavers as well as spinners. It allowed women to be things that have got nothing to do with the textile industry as well. Once that technology was introduced and women were freed from the spinning wheel, of course, a great deal changed. And it is worth thinking about in your world whether that technology or animal has come to pass and has freed the previous spinners from their spinning wheels and what that has resulted in. It's also worth thinking about if your current state of technology in your world is such that spinning is just beginning to be automated, what is the impact on your society's culture? Are they in a state of flux? Is everybody very uncertain, very unwilling to change? Is there protests in the streets to bring back the traditional spinning wheel? Is there currently conflict between the new technology that's coming in and the old that is phasing out? But this is fantasy. So what about the magical and fantastical elements of spinning? Of course, we are all familiar with the spinning wheel, fairy tale, you prick your finger and you fall into a hundred years sleep. But spinning can actually be quite a fundamental thing to magic. You could spin the magical threads together. You could spin the threads of fate. There is in the Seven Seas role-playing game, there's a very interesting take on the fate witches who can see the threads of people's lives and in fact can manipulate people's lives by tying threads together. So you could build a magic system that's based around spinning of magic and the use of threads in order to create magical effects, which would be a very interesting magic system and would be very interesting in terms of your mages if they are then spinners. Naturally, of course, there are also things like Rumpelstiltskin, where spinning transmuted things. So Rumpelstiltskin transmuted straw into gold. But you could use that process of spinning, taking something common, like cotton bulbs, and transforming it into something spectacular, like thread, which is used in everything, and really lean into it and make spinning a transmutational experience. You could also have spinning wheels and spindles be magical devices. So it's maybe not a case of the spinner is magic, maybe the item is magic and you need a special kind of spindle in order to create a special kind of thread that then creates, you know, your world's magical cloth that is used in magic. It's also worth thinking about, let's say you're an underwater world. So what do you spin? Maybe you use seagrass. Maybe you 
take the baleen out of a whale's mouth and spin that into thread, which is then woven into cloth. So what is available to your civilization to make them spin that into thread, which is then used in cloth? So think about things like the plants that are available to them, the animal products that are, that are available to them, like wool, and any magical components that are available to them, and whether there is a magical transmutation process involved in the spinning. And those are my thoughts on spinning in fantasy worlds. I hope that you have enjoyed this episode. Please do give it a thumbs up if you did. And if you'd like to support me in if you'd like to support me in making more of these, links to my Kofi page and my books down below. And I will see you soon for another episode of Just in Time World.